Hello, we're here with the great um, political philosopher Michael Sandel. Thank you so much for interviewing with us. Um, now, Mr. Sandel, you've been giving renowned lectures in Harvard for about more than 30 years, and today here you're at the LSE. How would you compare the two intellectual atmospheres in these great institutions? Well, I love the intellectual atmosphere here this evening. Uh, we did two lectures, and they weren't really lectures. They were interactive discussions. And I found that the audience, uh, the majority of, of which uh, consisted of LSE students, was very responsive, very engaged with the issues, and highly articulate in giving their views on some hard uh, political questions, but also philosophical issues. So I was very impressed, not only by the intellectual level, but by the spirit and the energy that I felt in the room. I, did you find the same? Definitely, definitely. It's always great to have this energy and intellectualism at the same time, but do you feel like there's any limitation in these sort of interactions? Because we're, at the end of the day, discussing topics like justice and fairness, and we're sitting with yeah. a group of um, academics and um, university students. Do you, do you think there's any limitation or biasness in the audience we have? Well, we couldn't say that this is a scientific representative survey or sample of opinion. That's true. But I was struck by the remarkable diversity within the audience and among the students. Uh, I think among the students who spoke, we probably had students who, uh, insofar as they identified from where they came, come from at least six or eight different places, probably, uh, probably as many as a dozen around the world. And... Um, so I'm, I'm really struck by the rich diversity of background that students bring to the LSE. This is famously true of the LSE for, for some time. LSE is indeed the most um, international university in the world, so we are very grateful for that. Um, can I ask you, like, you, you gave discussions on really intellectually stimulating topics, but um, you didn't express your own viewpoints on them. Would you like to give us your viewpoints on both these great questions that you asked, um, firstly on the responsibilities of um, educational institutes and then the wage allocations that occur in the economy? Right. What are your personal viewpoints? As you've probably been engrossed in their studies and researches yourself for quite a long time. Right. Well, it is true that in the lectures I didn't give my own views because the goal was to bring out the competing philosophical views among the students and, and within the audience. But I do have views on these questions. It's, um, it might take longer to fully work them out than we have here, but in my book, uh, which is related to these topics... Is this your new book that's about to come out? or Well, on these topics, uh, it's more to do with um, my book, Justice, What's the Right Thing to Do? where I do talk about the question of fairness and pay and different ways of thinking about it, and I give um, something of my own view on it, and also university admissions. So both of those are discussed in my book, Justice. The, the, uh, the yeah, new can you tell us about your new book as well? We're sure. quite interested about Sure. The new book is coming out uh, in April, the end of April, and it's called What Money Can't Buy, The Moral Limits of Markets. So it's, it is somewhat connected to the question of markets and their relation to morality and justice. But the, the book, What Money Can't Buy, is about, um, about the following question. Are there certain goods and social practices that should not be governed by market principles and market reasoning? Do we lose something if we put everything up for sale? So it looks at examples ranging from family and personal relations to social practices like education, health, citizenship, the environment, and asks, sometimes does the introduction, sometimes does the introduction of markets crowd out important non-market values? That's the question. A famous economist once said that it's not the limitation of markets that give it, gives us very narrow views, but it's the um, lack of identifying appropriate markets, which, which is a failure on our behalf, that limits us from arriving at the right answers. So, for example, if we don't look at the market of pollution, we um, mistakenly assume that it's beneficial for 
industries to pollute more, but that's not the case because we are disregarding looking at certain markets. Do you, do you share that viewpoint? Only to a point. I agree that, as economists say, there are certain externalities that are not included within market pricing. Pollution is a famous one because if there is no price on the air or on spewing pollutants into the water, we'll have more of it than we more pollution than we want. So there can be some role for markets in environmental regulation, but I think that that economic analysis does not go far enough. I think that in order to decide where markets belong, we have to engage with ethics and with questions of justice, not just efficiency. Great. Um, my last question is just a very really comical one. Um, I've heard that the famous Simpson character, Mr. Burns, has been um, drawn after you. Is that is that myth true? Do you think I look like Mr. Burns? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's true. It's an urban legend. And uh, there were some of the writers from The Simpsons, I think, took the course I teach at Harvard. So it's possible, but I think it's very unflattering. <laughs> well, thank you so much for interviewing <laughs> with us, Mr. Sandel. It was pleasure. great. My pleasure. Thank you.